Hi everybody, I hope you're doing marvellously well. In today's episode, we're in the gatehouse at Abbey Road Studios, which is a beautiful studio at the front. Absolutely incredible place. And we are blessed to have the rather wonderful Mr. Mirak Styles. Mirak is an incredibly talented engineer in his own right with wonderful, wonderful credits. Mirak is the Abbey Road products manager, meaning when it comes to hardware stuff like the Chandler stuff, the software stuff like Waves and all of the other incredible things that they do. He's the man and he knows the gear well because he's a real engineer. And in this episode, he's gonna take us through some of the most incredible classic hardware that you have heard on some of the greatest albums of all time. Uh, yeah, so this is the curve bender, otherwise known as the RS56, but that name isn't as sexy as it, let's face it. Um, it's a bit of a beast. It's probably like, definitely like the heaviest piece of uh, outboard in the building. It's not um, very popular when someone requests it, I think. It's, um, it's the, I think it's the world's first parametric EQ. So designed by uh, EMI Central Research Laboratories um, in the uh, mid 50s. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's just a really kind of musical sounding EQ. It's, it's passive. So there's nothing active going on in there. So, so when most people use it, they, they usually put like a, like a V72 preamp maybe in front of it or behind it just to sort of give it a bit of oomph. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's unusual. It's a, it's, it's all mechanical. So it's, um, it's stereo. So you've got a left and right here. And, um, so when you turn the left, it automatically turns the right on this cog system behind but if you if you pull the left hand side you can then adjust that independently from the right hand side but it's just like it's it's, it's unusual you know no i don't think anyone makes anything like this anymore but the reason why it's called the curve bender that was like a nickname this was actually designed for the mastering rooms disc cutting that sort of thing and the studios didn't have anything as powerful as this i mean you know you can actually dig into frequencies uh that's like 5k 8k 11 16k and then the low end you got kind of you know 32 64 129 there was nothing like that in the studios in the studios on the desks it was very basic a fixed eq probably at i think it was 10k um and 60 hertz so so this was like you know the engineers couldn't wait to get their hands on this when they found out like it existed um and they would like you know sort of effectively steal it from the cutting rooms and and use it in the recording studios and it became known as the curve bender because of its ability to just literally sort of mangle the sound, unlike any other devices they, they had access to at the time. How many of them were there? I don't think there were a huge amount of these made. They came in two flavors, stereo and mono. We've only got this one stereo one here. I've never seen a mono one anywhere. Um, they're rare. They're really rare. But there's, there's only one at Abbey Road. Yeah, we've only got one left. I don't know how many more. I don't know how many. I mean, in terms of how many were kicking around back in the day, there's probably like, I think there was like three or four master rooms. There would have been at least three or four knocking around, but who knows where this gear ends up. I mean, yeah, so I mean, what I mean by passive is there's, there's no power. You don't have to plug it in. Um, obviously, you have to plug audio into it and out of it, but you don't have to plug any power into it. Uh, so yeah, it's completely passive. Um, we, did a, we did a recreation of this with uh, Waves, the RS-56 plugin. Um, I, I love it over stereo mixes. Uh, I love it over drum buses as well. It's, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's got a certain character to it. It's, um, and it's quite, you can actually dig in. It's quite, um, you can get quite um, forensic with it, if you like. Because um, you kind of, you can change the shape of the curves as well. And I, I love this naming they've got. So you've got, um, you got low end, you've got blunt, you've got mid blunt, you've got mid sharp, sharp and high end. And they're, they're the shapes of the curves. Um, so I don't know, words like blunt and sharp, I mean, you, you don't see that on gear these days either. So again, it makes it unique. Yeah, I mean, the other thing about passive EQs is that, you know, in, in theory, it doesn't mess with the phase as much. So it's kind of a, 
it's a purer, a purer sound, if you like. And also, so we, so we did the plug-in with Waves. Uh, with, there's actually a hardware recreation, which its roots are embedded in 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 this device. Uh, it's kind of like the best of this and the best of the uh, EMI TG EQs. But with Chandler, we did the Curve Bender stereo EQ unit. Below the Curve Bender, we have the RS124, the legendary RS124. Which is actually a well, it, st it started off being an Altec compressor, but it's nothing like an Altec compressor anymore. Um, the story goes in the late 50s, so it's so a rock and roll started to be recorded at Abbey Road in the uh, kind of mid 50s. And the, the engineers at the time were kind of, you know, it, it was a new thing, this amplified music, you know, and a lot of the engineers at the time, people like, Malcolm Addy and Pete Baum, um, Stuart Eltham, they were kind of adapting what they learned from, from classical recording and, and pop music that wasn't amplified at the time into this kind of amplified music. So it was new territory. And, and they were hearing the records, the rock and roll records coming over from the States, and they were trying to chase that sound. There was kind of more low end going on. There was kind of um, a nice sort of compression sort of thing going on. Um, and they, 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 they were basically trying to chase that. They were trying to get to that. So, so Pete Baum, uh, one of the pop engineers here, he went over to Capitol Studios in the States in the, in the late 50s, uh, 1959, I think, um, to do a bit of a recce, find out what they were using over there. And he noticed that what they were using over there a lot were these, um, these Altec compressors. Um, so he got, um, came back to Abbey Road, you know, made his reports to the, to the powers that be and managed to convince um, the studios to get some of these Altex sent over, shipped over from the States because they weren't available here. It was quite common back then for, for any equipment that came in from outside of the EMI kind of arena, as it were. Um, you know, Abbey Road used to get all their gear from EMI and help design that gear, et cetera, et cetera. So it was all in-house. But anything that came from outside entities was given like a thorough, thorough going over by the technical department because they didn't want any bad equipment getting into their recording chains you know it kind of makes sense so they opened up these Altec compressors and and i don't think they liked what they saw they pretty much gutted them they changed the capacitors the resistors the valves um they added more controls so they added like a recovery control i mean the original Altec was like pretty bare it was like one gain control i think and everything else was fixed um and they added a output attenuation uh they, <laughs> they just turned it into a completely different beast uh, the only thing that I think is, they even changed the color from green to gray. Uh, the only thing that's recognizable from the Altec is the original meter with the Altec logo on it. So, so they ended up with a completely different beast, completely unique because they're only made at Abbey Road. I mean, these mods were done by uh, Bill Livy, Mike Batchelor, and Len Page. Um, and then they found their way into the studios and, and people sort of fell in love with them. And they are, uh, I've never found that another compressor like it. It's um, a unique sound. They can be really aggressive. Um, they, none of the Altecs sounded the same. The, the technical engineers were always playing around with the attack times, recovery times, that sort of thing. So they, that some of the Altec compressors with different release times and attack times were more favorable in the studio. Some were more favorable in the cutting rooms, depending on how aggressive they were. So there were a few different flavors knocking around. So yeah, they, they became the thing a legend because the Beatles engineers um, would would kind of use them over the um, over the the main buses of the Red Desk, or or later on they started to use them. Like Jeff Remick started to use them over the um, actual kind of you know bass guitar sort of sound, Paul McCartney's bass guitar sound, that sort of thing. So they just kind of like they became known in this thing of legend, and because they were never available anywhere else, they were completely unique to Abbey Road. That just amplified the legendary status because there weren't many of them ever made. So. They kind of went out of, they kind of, they were kind of decommissioned, I would say, in in the seventies and, and certainly in the eighties. And I remember I was assisting a a John Bryan session in Studio Two uh, with Fiona Apple, and and John had heard of these things, um, and he asked if they were only around. And I personally, at that stage, had never heard of them before. So I went to Lester Smith and I said, "Look, Lester, John's asking if you've got any RS one two fours, or if there's any RS one two fours in the building." And uh, Lester said, well, yeah, you know, kind of let me, let me see what I can do. And Lester's funny. He's kind of, <laughs> he's got things hidden away in cupboards that we don't quite know if they exist or not. And suddenly he surprises us. And this was one of those occasions. He came into the, 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 the control room of Studio Two and 
had this RS124 and we, we plugged it up and John Bryan was like really excited and we, we put a bass guitar through it and it was like, I remember John just saying like, that's it, like that's the sound sort of thing. So, um, so we ended up getting three um, back into the studio workflow off the back of that session. And um, so we've done a plug-in of the RS-24 with Waves and we've done a hardware recreation with Chandler Limited. So now something that was very rare um, is now available to, you know, music makers all over the world, which is a, a good thing. So, yeah, we, we recreated the RS-24 with, with uh, Wade at Chandler. Uh, this is it here. It's, um, I mean, it's a great, it's a very faith, faithful recreation. I mean, I've, I've got the impression that people before have tried to kind of mod their Altex to be the RS-124, but we've kind of kept a, you know, we've kind of kept the, the secret sources that were as a guarded kind of thing. It's kind of the, the schematics that are kept in archives and they're, you know, we keep those to ourselves. Um, but, but Wade, you know, we, we pulled out the notes and and Wade went through them and we um we kind of well we've recreated the RS124 and um not only that but we've we've added a few extra options on it because the the original one didn't have variable attack it was fixed depending on how it had been tweaked by which particular technical engineer uh but on this one we've got kind of got variable attack but we've also recreated the attack times related to the serial numbers so uh yeah this one's 6C70B and uh, so we've got 6070B here, which is the most aggressive one, and then the slower attack ones, which are being used in Studio 2 at the moment, I think. Uh, we've got those serial numbers as well, so you kind of got those different flavors, and then you can go slower or even faster. Um, there's a cool feature we added called, we call it the Super Fuse, which is, we kind of modded the fuse switch. It's not a fuse anymore, but it's a switch. Um, and that sets the attack time the same as the release time, so it's sort of fighting against itself, and it's like gets it gets really aggressive. Um, it's great over like drum rooms and stuff like that. It's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, it's a great recreation. Um, and we kind of, we got a few, uh, quite a lot of these in the building to year three, which we went to go and check out yesterday. I mean, there's, um, there's, uh, a red, two red preamps from Chandler and two, um, RS 24s from Chandler kind of in the embedded in the SSL desk on the left-hand side. And I think that's for me, that's like, one of the ultimate recording chains, sort of red preamp with RS-124, it's great. So yeah, this is this is the red preamp uh, that we created with Chandler, um, the red 47, which, uh, so, so the red department here at Abbey Road was, um, it was like an R&D uh, set up by, uh, I think it was set up by Len Page or Bill Libby, one of the two, I forget, but one of the technical engineers at Abbey Road at the time. Uh, the point of it was, was to, um, work closely with the central research laboratories for EMI over in Hayes. Uh, so, you know, they would design gear over there, send it over to Abbey Road, Abbey Road would field test it and then go back to Hayes with notes and, and vice versa. It was like a collaboration. So, so the red department is, um, uh, they came up with a lot of designs and ideas and, and the red 47 preamp was the preamp that went inside the red 51 mixing console. And that's the mixing console that recorded a vast majority of the Beatles sessions and in fact every single pop session probably in Studio 2 from uh, pretty 64 right up to 69 when the TG desk went in. Uh, so they were a proper workhorse desk, it saw a lot of action and the preamps were, were unique. So the red 17 desk and the red 37 desk also made by EMI, they used the Seaman V72 preamps which were used by a lot of different, um, well used in a lot of different facilities around the world. The Red 47 preamp was actually EMI designed. Uh, it was a unique beast. It was, I would describe it as um, a little bit more grittier than the, the V72. It's got a certain sound to it, uh, and you can hear it in those in those Beatles recordings. You know, they, they, you know, some of those recordings sound a bit rough and ready, and that's part of the charm. It's part of the sound that people want. It's it's a, a great sound. So the preamp is is something we wanted to recreate with with Chandler, uh, and um, yeah, here it is. It's um, just it's a very uh, you know, if you want to preamp with lots of color, it's valve, you know, if you want to preamp with lots of color, um, this, this is the preamp for you. These preamps were originally kind of like so big and they just sort of slot into the side of the mixing console. Um, not much to them. Uh, so you've got an input gain, uh, 
which is like fixed. Um, and then you've got a fine gain if you need to dig in between those fixed settings on the input gain. Uh, and then we've got um, an output control and a thing called a, or a rumble filter, which is like, you know, to get rid of the low end if you need to, the proper low end. I think rumble filter was was something we would often see referred to in the old EMI notes. And I thought it was, it sounds cool, like a rumble filter. Again, it goes back to the kind of blunt and sharp and curve bender and, and rumble filter. I mean, I, I love all those old terminologies we found in the original um, EMI tech reports, they called them. They had like confidential written on the front, these books, they were, they were green. And that's kind of where all the, that's where all the secrets and reports and all that stuff were, were kind of um, filed. So things like rumble filter, I think are great. I love using those old terminologies and yeah, just an output control and things that probably weren't, well, they weren't on the original things like um, a pad and um, phase reverse. And we've actually, we've added a DI as well. So you can plug your, your bass guitar or your guitar amp straight into it. I, I have read somewhere that they decided to make their own preamp because yeah, they didn't want to pay for someone else's preamp, right? They don't want to keep it in house. Um, and yeah, they, they tried to make it cheaper. Um, and I think the fact that they ended up with a kind of grittier sounding preamp was kind of a bit of a mistake. I don't think they were particularly going for that, but it just, it, it, I mean, it sounded brilliant. I mean, the V72s are fun. We've got, cause we, we, we put them in the red desk. That's what powers the red desk, obviously. Um, and when, you know, when you match the V72s, cause you've got three, uh, gain stages in the, in the desk, you kind of got the, the the mic pre, then you've got a, what they call an interamp, then the output amp. So you've got three stages of V72. Then when you add that to the EQ on the red desk, then you've got flavor. I mean, that, the red 17 is great fun. Uh, but I might, yeah, like a V72 on its own, just by itself. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if, yeah, like I said, I think it may have been a happy accident, but the red 47 has just got a hell of a lot more character. Um, so the, yeah, the RS660, that is, that was our latest release we did with Chandler. Um, this is a kind of a, 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 a different thing, really. It, it was like, Wade and I kind of have, have kind of studied the old technical notes. Um, and there's some really interesting stuff in there. I mean, I, I love going through those old notes of Bill Libby, Len Page, Mike Batchelor. Um, and as I said earlier on, they're, they're always kind of messing around with the RS124 trying to improve it, trying to make it more versatile, faster, slower, all that sort of stuff. And it's funny that the, the, the TG compressors, um, they were actually trying to recreate the, the Fairchild 660. If you, um, if you look at the front panel of a Fairchild 660 and the, the options you've got on a, on a TG compressor, they're kind of like, they look kind of similar, the six different kind of um, time variation settings, that sort of thing. But of course, the EMI compressor sounded nothing like the 660. It was almost like a joke, like they kind of messed it up or something. I don't know what was going on. I mean, one was valve, obviously, and one was transistor. But whatever, <laughs> whatever they created with, they, uh, with the TG just sounded nothing like the 660, which was a good thing because the TG sounded amazing. So it's kind of interesting that when we look through all the different technical notes, the fact that the, the TG was supposed to be something more like the 660, and then the fact that they were always trying to tweak the RS-124, it was kind of like this RS-660 is kind of like an idea of where they may have taken it next. Um, because unfortunately, the, the RS-124s and the, the TGs and all that, it kind of all fell out of favor. The reason being is because things came onto the scene like Valley People with the gain brains and stuff like that. And so there was a lot more gear by this stage. We're talking about the kind of early 70s now. There's a lot, there was a lot more gear being made by manufacturers not associated to a record label, i.e. not associated to EMI. So there was less of a need for EMI to kind of make their own gear because this other stuff became funky, fashionable, whatever you want to call it. So it, it, it was a transition from Abbey Road making their own gear with EMI to Abbey Road buying what people wanted, which was kind of like the latest fads, not fads, but you know, the latest kind of gear that people were using in other studios. So things like Valley People, Game Brains came in, all that sort of stuff. So, so the compressors kind of, they just sort of, things like the RS-24, they were kind of left alone and other stuff came in. So, so we were looking through the notes and we, we could see where they were trying to take it or where they may have gone next. So that was the inspiration for the RS-660. It's kind of like a hybrid of of RS-124, TG, and, and Fairchild. 
So here we have the TG desk. This is the Mark II, uh, one section of it. The other section is actually being used in Studio 2 at the moment for a tracking session. Um, so this was the first uh, transistorized desk made by EMI. So before this, uh, all the desks were valve. So you had the Red 17, the Red 37, and the Red 51 desks. And um, in 1968, they basically eight track was introduced to Abbey Road. And those red desks were only ever designed to be used with four track tape machines. So it was becoming a bit of a problem. They're having to do a lot of hacks and workarounds, that sort of thing. So, so a new desk was, 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 was designed. It was needed uh, to, to cope with eight track recording. Uh, but at the time, transistorized recording equipment was also kind of like the new thing. So they, they, they abandoned the vibe of the, of the, of the valves and, and went with transistor. Um, so the Mark I TG desk was, was installed in 1969 at Abbey Road. It was used very famously on the Abbey Road album by the Beatles. Um, and you can kind of hear the sonic difference. So a lot of those, uh, well, a lot of those Beatles records um, up until um, Abbey Road sounded sonically quite different to Abbey Road. Abbey Road sounded sort of quite clean and quite polished. Uh, a lot of that can be attributed to this TG desk, which, which was actually a bit of a shock to the system, I think, for the recording engineers, because they were used to valve desks and they were used to kind of like driving them hard and getting that certain sound. And then suddenly they had this quite relatively, in comparison, clean sounding desk that you couldn't drive too hard because it would start to break up a lot more easily and wouldn't sound particularly pleasant. So I think they had to rethink a bit how they were doing things. It was a bit of an adjustment period. Um, but having said that, um, the, you know, the TG desks stuck around till the early 80s at Abbey Road. I mean, they've got a beautiful sound to them. It was, it was the first console to actually have a compressor and limiter in every single channel, which is like completely norm now, but back then that was unheard of. Um, it had more flexible EQ. Um, the red desks has had fixed top and fixed bottom. Uh, this one kind of like you can sweep some of the frequencies and um, kind of dig in a bit more. Um, so it was, um, it was a completely different beast. And so the Mark three sits permanently in studio three and the Mark two, um, kind of floats around, um, but it gets used in studio two quite a lot. And um, people just love to use them, uh, from the point of view of having it as like a sidecar, if you want that certain sound. So a lot of people like to put drums through this desk because the preamps, uh, sound great on drums, great on transients. Uh, the compressors are really aggressive. So sound great on, on drums. Uh, so yeah, people like to use the best of both worlds, kind of like modern preamps with kind of the funkier kind of TG preamps. We've done plugins of this and we've done hardware recreation of this as well with Chandler. So the plugins with Waves and the hardware with Chandler. Um, this has got a great sound, very different to the red sound, but another unique part of Abbey Road's history and a part of Abbey Road's um, sort of sound fingerprint. I think during the White Album, I think it was George Harrison who, who got wind of the fact that there was actually an eight track tape machine in the building. But it was being um, it was being inspected by the technical department, and it was taking like a long time. They were like literally dissecting this thing and making sure it complied with all the EMI standards, all that sort of stuff. Um, but what happened was the story goes is that uh, George Harrison convinced uh, Ken Scott, I think was the recording engineer on the White Album, he convinced Ken to go down to the technical department and drag this machine out, plug it in, and use it illegally, sort of thing. And and um, I think Ken got in a lot of trouble for that, but. It was a George Harrison request. So, so it, I think the White Album was kind of bits of it were done on four track and bits of it were done on eight track. And that's the reason why is because eight track hadn't been officially uh, endorsed by EMI at that stage. But the, um, the eight track was 3M and, and um, the J37 was Studer, but the J37 was a valve tape machine. So again, that would have given a very different flavor. To, so you kind of, you were going from valve desk and valve tape machine to like, you know, non-valve equipment, uh, transistorized desks, the 3M tape machine. So that would have given a very different flavor to the results of the recordings done at the time. So yeah, I mean, in terms of the frequencies they chose for the EQs, I think everything kind of went back to, to, to this beast here, the, the curve bender, the RS-56. They were, CRL, the Central Research Laboratories, were just, it was R&D, you know, and they, they chose these curves because to them, they sounded the most musical and were the, were the most useful for, well, particularly the cutting rooms for, for kind of mastering, for dealing with lacquer, that sort of thing. But, but those EQ curves just seem to sort of translate 
over to, to the TG. Um, so you've got similar curves. Is. I mean, like you've got 500. Um, you've got 500 on here, which is great for kind of removing mud, that sort of thing. So it would have been great for, for cutting rooms. Um, but it's also great for things like kick drums and stuff like that to sort of get rid of that kind of boxiness. Um, and similar curves, like 1.2, 1, 1 2.8, 4.2. I mean, those are on the curve bender. We've got, um, yeah, 1.2, 1, 1 2.4. 2 you can see the similarities um, and the same in the top end as well. So, so I think the kind of the EMI EQ curves were all inspired by this. This is where, this is where, it's, this is where it began. Funnily enough, I mean the compression on the on the TG, the, the TG compression was supposed to be a a recreation of the um, Fairchild 660, which it sounded nothing like. Uh, but it's got kind of it's got the same sort of um, kind of recovery settings. Um, so you can see you can see some sort of similarities, but it was a completely different beast um, they created. But if anything, I think the well. The TG, especially in limit mode, is like super, super aggressive. It's more aggressive than a than a six sixty is. Um, so they they kind of more luck than judgment, or or maybe a happy accident, something along those lines. They they created something that was completely unique. So these these channels were actually called cassettes. These these things actually, they, you know, these they lift out and they they referred to them as cassettes back then. Um, you know, EMI had to do things differently. Um, so yeah, the microphone cassettes we've actually recreated with Chanda Limited. We've got the microphone cassette here. Um, very similar in terms of the EQ and, and, the, com and the compression um, and limiting. And um, the, the, the compression and limiter section, the TG, has actually been recreated as a rack mount device as well by Chandler, by Wade. Um, it's, kind of, it's called the Xena limiter. And it uses the inspiration of this, the nuts and bolts of this, the foundations of this, but, but adds more attack times and more recovery times to make it a bit more flexible for modern day uses. Yeah, so, so this one down the bottom here is, I, I love this. Um, another Chanda design by Wade. It's, it's a channel strip and, and we, we didn't call it a channel strip, we called it a cassette, a channel cassette, which again is that it, it goes back to the funky terminology used by EMI. So the original um, EMI TG desks, each each channel, which was actually two channels in, in one device that was modular. And effectively, it's a recreation of the, um, of the TG desk channels. So you've got preamp, uh, you've got compressor, and you've got EQ uh, with an output control, which acts like you know, kind of like the original fader uh, with, you know, modern things as well, like the, the phase reverse which i don't think was on the, well, it wasn't on the original desk and um phantom power and that sort of thing so this is like an all-in-one kind of uh tg channel strip channel cassette and yeah it's 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 a really useful device yes yeah, so these modules these cassettes which were it was designed this way so there wasn't any downtime the red desks for example there were no modular features in in the red desk so if one of the channels went down you had to sort of shut down the session as it were and they had to open up the entire desk and have a look and see what the problem is. But with the TG desks, if there was a problem with one of the channels, you just literally kind of like unscrew it, take it out and put another one in so you could carry on. And, and you know, other desk manufacturers did that, you know, people like Neve did that eventually. So I guess it was kind of setting those standards in a way of kind of making things kind of a bit more fluid um, when things went wrong. And, um, you know, zero downtime. Downtime is, you know, the thing you least want in a studio. Um, and these desks, the TG desks, they hung around at Abbey Road for a while. I mean, um, there was a big wraparound desk in Studio 2 and Studio 1. There's some great photographs in Studio 1 of orchestral sessions being done on the TG desk. Um, and early film scores recorded at Abbey Road, like Raiders of the Lost Ark and Return of the Jedi, they were all scored, they were all mixed and recorded like through a TG desk. So that sounds in the film, you know. So here we have the J37 four track tape machine. Uh, made by Studer. Uh, this was a big deal at Abbey Road in the 60s. It kind of changed a lot of things. Um, it kind of changed how sessions were run. So before this, uh, Abbey Road were using the Telefunken four-track tape machine, which is a bit of a big beast, and it, it, it sat in a separate machine room, not in the control room. So there was this kind of divide, if you like, this separation between producer, recording engineer, or balance engineers, I think they were referred to back then, and the tape op, 
the tape up would be in a different room, would be sat with a pair of headphones on and there'd be like a communication device set up. So they were kind of removed from the session. This, this, this tape machine sort of business went off, it, it went on in the background. And then when the J37 came onto the scene, about 1964, I think, um, it was small enough to actually have it in the back of the actual control room itself. So suddenly the tape op and the tape machine were in the control room, not in a separate room. And that changed the dynamic of the recording session. Uh, you had better communicate. Just little things like communication can change a, a, a lot of dynamics in, in, in the session. It's like really important, obviously, to be able to communicate. And then it's almost like the tape machine became part of the um, part of more part of the re recording equipment in the control room, uh, the recording stage. Uh, you know, the engineer could jump in and do and do a punch in, um, or the the engineer could start playing around with the vary speed to kind of get get different effects. And and then when the Beatles started to show more of an interest in the control room, because I mean back then. Before the Beatles, it was it was kind of almost like the the band stayed in the uh, recording area and were never allowed into the into the control room. It just wasn't done. And the Beatles kind of were interested, you know, what's going on in that room and showed an interest in in the equipment. Um, so they started to sort of like look at this equipment and and you know with the engineers like Jeff Emmerich and and producer George Martin, they started to explore how we can use these, these devices in, in new and creative ways. So things like picking up, recording um, like a guitar, for example, picking up the spool, turning it over and playing it backwards. I mean, a tape machine was never designed to be played backwards, you know, but, but they were using equipment in ways it, it kind of wasn't designed to be used. Uh, things like overloading the input, um, things like kind of just grabbing your thumb and kind of like putting it over the flange and to get that juddery kind of, well, flanging, that's, that's where flanging came from. The sound, the sound of flanging was doing that. And then playing around with the very speed, speeding things up, slowing things down, just manipulating sound. I mean, a tape machine was designed to, to, to kind of give you the, the purest recording possible, but, but they were using it, you know, <laughs> abusing the facilities as it were and, and kind of like, manipulating sounds using the tape machine. So the, the tape machine became a, an effect in a way. Um, so there, there were two like big, big things that came off the back of, of the J37 off through the Beatles. One was the concept of, of ADT and the other one was the concept of, of um, they called it super imposition, I think, but it was effectively kind of layering sounds um, using the J37. So. If we look at ADT first of all, so ADT was uh, invented by Ken Townsend, who was one of the technical engineers here, um, and the, the Beatles loved to double track their vocals. But, well, they double track a lot, but particularly their vocals. Um, but double tracking is like a really uh, kind of grueling thing to do. You kind of obviously got to lay down your original vocal, and then you've got to go back and, and sing and double up that vocal, but it's actually quite a, a tricky thing to do. You've got to get your phrasing exactly right, your timing exactly right. And if you don't spend time on it and make it um, as neat as possible, you, you've suddenly got like a very messy sounding double track and no one likes the sound of that. You kind of, you've got to be on the ball as it were when it comes to double tracking. So it's quite a laborious process. And, and John was like, you know, is there a way we can do this technically? Um, so Ken Townsend went away and thought about it and he came up with the idea of ADT, which was effectively Recording a, a vocal on the J37, Ken Townsend thought, well, why don't we lay down the vocal and then come off the sync head and play that into a second tape machine, a BTR tape machine, which was the stereo mix down machines, and then manipulate the vary speed of the second machine, the BTR machine, to kind of line it back up not exactly, but almost line it back up to the original signal. So you kind of got two signals doing this. Um, and that created the ADT sound. So it wasn't, if, if you just kind of put it through a tape machine and left it static, it would have been quite boring. The whole point of ADT is that you kind of got that thickening effect of not recreating something perfectly, but, but trying to recreate it. So if you just left the second machine static, it would have been quite boring. It would have been very convincing. But the fact that you're kind of playing with very speed and kind of moving the signals against one another, kind of got you got quite a, 
I wouldn't say it was like, it still sounded synthetic, but kind of synthetic in a cool sort of way. Anyway, the Beatles fell in love with it. And then they just started ADTing like not only vocals, but guitars and, and, and they just like really experimented with it. So, so that created the ADT sound. And again, that was quite a unique thing because um, one was the J37's ability to kind of tap off the different, the different heads on the machine. Um, mixed with the uh, the BTR2 and the very speed, um, but also um, kind of different filtering they had with the various sort of RS um, filters, and so they kind of created this unique beast of of um, of this this ADT concept, which I think a lot of people tried to recreate in studios outside of Abbey Road, but they never quite got the sound, and that's the reason why there's a lot of things going on, which just kind of were unique to the situation. Um, so there was that. And then the other really creative way they used the J37 was this concept of kind of layering. So obviously four tracks is certainly by today's standards quite limiting, very limiting. Um, but back then, I think it was a frustration that, you know, once you filled up your four tracks, like we, you know, we kind of, <laughs> we want to add more, we want to add more, you know, we want to build up these complicated layers and productions. So what they did was they would, fill up the four tracks of the first J37 tape machine, bring in another J37 tape machine, and they would take the four tracks and bounce that down onto one track of the second tape machine. Um, so that would leave you three more tracks to layer on. And they would do that like four or five times. Now the thing is, like that's like a, a massively committed way of recording. Because if you think of something complicated, like a really complicated production, like a day in the life, I mean, when you tell people that was done on a four track, it's like, people sort of say, well, how, you know, how did they do that? And that's how they did it by layering. Um, but effectively at the end of the day, you're still mixing from four tracks. It's just that everything's been bounced down. And, um, so if you decide you get to your final mix and you decide like the snare drum's not loud enough, there's like nothing you can do about that. Like it's a completely committed way of recording, which is interesting. You know, you're kind of layering up and building the production as you went along. Um, pretty a lot like kind of like EDM producers these days do. You know, you kind of you are kind of always building up on 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 the production, and that's how they recorded back then. So it's a very committed way of recording. Um, would have changed the psychology of recording, I think. You know, if if you said to like a band now, you're going to record your next album on the full track, it would freak them out, and quite rightly so. You know, people now are used to having hundreds of tracks, um, having three microphones on the snare drum and only making those decisions right at the very end. And you always know you can make those decisions right up until the very end. But back then that just didn't exist. You were making decisions as you went along. It was a very committed way of recording. And, and that was part of how they got those sounds. Um, that was part of the recording process. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having hundreds of tracks at your disposal. It gives everyone comfort and in, a, in most way, in many regards, it gives you freedom to be even more creative. But um, I just think it's very interesting that that's, that's how it was done back then. So um, let's, let's pop it open and have a look inside. It's a bit like a bonnet of a car, this. You kind of pop it open and change the oil. It's um, 54 valves, I think, are inside this, this, this machine. So, uh, you know, once you, once you got fired up, it's, um, it's warm, you know, you can feel it. Um, I mean, obviously we have air conditioning now, but I mean, it must've been pretty, pretty, uh, horrendous working in the control room back in the sixties, you know, no air con and you had a couple of these machines running. I mean, things would have got warm pretty quickly. I think so this is done 8,925 hours of recording. Well, for, for an eight hour day, that's 1,115 <laughs> Uh, eight hour days. The only, so the, the only lubricant that Lester could find that was fine enough to, to use on the capstan here was um, Swiss watch lubricate, lubrication. So you kind of put a dollop in that in and, it, and it's uh, good as new almost. Anyway, let's close it up. Uh, and don't get your fingers trapped. So here we have the Chandler Xena limiter and the Chandler curve bender. Obviously, inspired by the original TG compressor limiter and EQs, uh, but, but Wade's elaborated on them somewhat. Uh, so the Xena limiter, um, yeah, the foundations are the, the TG limiter and, and compressor, and it certainly has buckets of, of, of that flavor in there. 
uh, but he's expanded on it slightly and, and given variable release and attack times and and expanded on the release times. The original had release times, um, but they were very limited, like six fixed settings, whereas this one you can kind of, you know, lots of options as it were. Um, and then you've also got this, this side chain option, which effectively kind of lets you kind of um, filter out the compression from the low end. So you only affect the mid range and the, and the, and the top end and leave the, the low end alone, which is really useful. So, so yeah, this is, um, it's like, again, it's an extension of, 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 of that original TG gear to make it a bit more useful for, for modern day scenarios. And then we've got the, the curve bender, which the name is obviously inspired by the original um, RS-56, the curve bender, the sound mangala, according to the uh, recording engineers here at the time. Uh, and again, it's TG, TG curves, uh, TG inspired, TG circuitry, but just expanding on that as well, giving it more flexibility for modern day use cases. When I say expanded, um, so the, the, the frequencies you can dig into or or carve out um, have been massively expanded from the original desk. Um, just give the whole thing a bit more flexibility. Uh, and you can also um, boost the frequencies um, up or down um, in terms of um, range. Um, so there's this thing, um, times 1.5 uh, and times one. So you can, it's really flexible. So here we are in front of the red microphone. This is the first microphone we released with Chandler. Um, some people th think it's like a, a U47 style clone, but it isn't. It's a completely different thing. It's actually um, a K47 capsule that's wired directly into uh, a Red 47 preamp. Um, so the preamps that were in the original Red 51 desk, uh, which is very unusual. It's actually been painted by Chandler um, and you can adjust the, the mic gain on the back of the microphone here. So you can literally plug this mic directly into the back of your door. Uh, and it's just, um, it's both cardioid and omni. And it's basically a huge sounding microphone at the end of the day. It's got a pretty, pretty cool sound to it. It's very versatile. Uh, I've seen it used on everything from vocals to guitars to uh, people using them as decatries for film sessions. So like left, center, right in front of the orchestra. Um, and you know, you can, you can really drive it if you want to get that kind of really kind of gritty, uh, classic red 4.7 preamp sound. Um, or you can sort of make it back it off a bit and make it sound sort of quite beautiful and open. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great microphone. One, it's, it's unique. And I think I, that's the thing that I think Wade and I have always strived to do with with, with the mics, uh, well, with most of the Chandler gear actually, is just to present something sort of quite different, quite unique. Uh, and that's certainly achieved with this microphone. Um, just having the, the preamp on board just gives, um, just gives you a different perspective on microphones, I think. Yeah, so this is the Chandler TG microphone. This was the second microphone we released together. And again, it's, it's quite unusual. I've never seen anything else quite like it. It's a um, German capsule, uh, which goes into the amplifier stages found in the TG transfer desk that the mastering engineers still use. So um, a lot of the mastering engineers um, like to just use the input and output stages from the transfer desk and um, sometimes bypass the EQ and the compressors just to sort of get that classic TG sound. And um, that's kind of what's inside this microphone here. Um, but also, it's got the EQ curves from the original transfer desk. So um, there's four settings um, for NAB or IEC, uh, which were obviously originally designed to be used with different tape types. Um, but Wade and I started, ex um, well, Wade started experimenting with those and kind of fell in love with those, uh, those EQ curves. And then I started using them a lot myself. Um, just over things like uh, drums um, and guitars, you kind of it just adds a certain sort of like sort of character. It's the um, the curves are kind of like one of them removes some top end, the other one removes some bottom end, the other one boosts high and low, and the other one cuts high and low. Um, so these these curves are actually on the back of the microphone, so you can sculpt quite a lot of different sounds from the microphone at source. 
Um, I personally love the curve that boosts both the top and the bottom end at the same time. Um, it kind of, um, yeah, it's a really good sort of passive sounding EQ. Um, so again, it's just unique. Um, there's two different um, systems, system A and system B, which are two different tonal shapes. The system A is like a classic TG kind of upfront mid open sound. And the system B is um, a bit more, um, it, it, it can take higher SPL levels. So it sort of closes up on itself a bit more and you kind of get that sort of compressed sort of sound. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I, I love it on guitar amps personally. I've, I've heard a few engineers say things along the lines of, you know, they've, they've put it up against 67s and this one sort of tends to sort of come out on top. Um, and also it's just got like a, a real personality that you can, you can dig into, you can, you can shape the tone of the mic, um, to suit the source. So, you know, once you get to know those, those EQ curves, it's like a pretty, um, pretty useful tool to have under your belt. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, Mirak, for doing that. And of course, stay tuned for the Waves software walkthrough with Mirak as well. Thanks ever so much for watching. So long, farewell, avidezayan, au revoir, David senya. Tschüss. Goodbye. So long, farewell, avidezayan, au revoir. Adios. <laughs> <laughs>